Uh, so my name is Sandy McGuire. I'm going to be talking about Don't F It Up, Free Your Monads in Action, um, a talk by Sandy McGuire. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is kind of the story of like some problems we ran into at TACT. Um, I work at TACT. Uh, we're about a year old as a company, but our code base is about two years old, which doesn't super add up if you think about it. Um, that's because a lot of it was written by contractors, and a lot of it was written by contractors who didn't necessarily, weren't necessarily like Haskell contractors. Um, and so there's a lot of like IO kind of strewn everywhere, and it's maybe not as pure as we'd like. Um, and so it was it was a little tricky because we um, we couldn't test things as, as much as we like. We have to set up servers, and uh, this is kind of a talk of like what we learned and what we do now. Uh, so that's what it is. Before I get started, um, if you have uh, any questions about like what's on the slides or if something doesn't make sense, please ask. Um, that's great. Uh, we've got tons of time. If you have a fun anecdote you'd like to share. Or if you think I'm wrong or an idiot or something, um, I'd love to hear that as well, but let's do it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so for your moments in action. Um, so, there's this uh, maybe rite of passage, I guess. If you talk about monads, you have to write about banking <coughs> for some stupid reason. And I don't want to break that tradition. So, we are going to make a very simple banking app. Um, essentially, it's like a withdraw function. You're going to say how much money you want, um, and then We'll see if you have enough. If you don't, we'll log an error. Otherwise, we'll withdraw or we'll give you that money. Right? Is this is this legible, to everyone? It's marvelous. Okay. Um, so we're good functional programmers, right? And we write our text first, and we say, okay, we have some polymorphic M which has monad IO. We have, and also like a monad logger. Um, this integer here is the the money we want to um, withdraw, and then if we're successful, it'll give us just that much. Otherwise, we'll say nothing. Right. Um, Nothing very exciting. This is this is Monet code. Uh, everyone's written right. Um, so here it is. It's not exciting. How much money do we want? Check our current balance. Uh, if that if we don't have enough money, we we write an error. Return nothing. Otherwise, we update our balance uh, to the amount, and then we say, okay, great, right. So this looks like it works. Maybe right. Um, but the question is like, how can we test this? Um, it's it's a little tricky, right? This is all an I/O, um, and like. I don't know, right? Maybe we need to talk to a database or something. Um, so there's an obvious answer, and that's uh, we can have this like mode thing. And this might not be the only way to do it, but it's certainly in some way <laughs> the way we have been doing it. Um, so it's like, are, which which mode are we in? Are we like test? Are we running it for real, or is it a test? And if it's a test, we have this like IO wrap of an integer, which is like our bank account that we're gonna like run in memory, right? Uh, seems reasonable. It might be not the best way to do it, but it'll work. Um, so these red is like the changes we need to do in order to get the code we wrote into uh, into this testing plan, right? We need to pass in the mode, and then every time we do anything with our bank account, we need to like case on what mode we're in, um, either run the thing we're going to do before or like update our IRF, right? Um, and so it looks like we've done it; it looks successful, right? Um, but it sucks. There's like IO everywhere. We've interspersed our test code uh, with the code we actually want to run. And the, the biggest problem, I think, is the compiler isn't going to tell us if we successfully mocked everything, right? We just have IO everywhere, and like, hopefully we got it right. And in this small example, hopefully, right? Um, but like in a bigger program, there's no way we're going to catch everyone, right? Uh, it's just not going to happen. So um, it'd be really nice if we could just like write the program that we care about, right? It's like that first thing we wrote is, is really the semantics we want. And um, it would be great if that could just be what we wrote, and then we got all the testing for free. Uh, so you guys should know how to do this, right? We write this like MTL Mona bank thing, and it's got some M. And then the, uh, the IO actions we had before become members of this class. And so um, this is all kind of the same thing, right? There's nothing different here. It's just not an IO anymore. Uh, so this actually lets us write the code that we want, right? <laughs> uh, now it's Mona bank instead of an IO. So we solved the IO problem. Um, we don't have these like gnarly case statements anymore, and it's just like it looks like the code we wanted and had, right? So it seems like we're done, right? We we solved the problem, right? Uh, we can abstract over I/O, and we just like switch out that M, and we have like one monad for testing. We use a different one for running it in production. Everything works. We've done. We're great. We're amazing. Uh, and it's all great, right? Um, and this this works. The problem is. There's a huge amount of boilerplate we need to do in order to get this to actually work, right? Um, first thing is we need some carrier, right? We need some new type to write our monad instance over, right? And so this is the thing. It's like identity just so we can derive monad trans. It's the only thing we want that from. Um, 
and it just doesn't do anything, right? There's, no, there's nothing here. It's just to attach an instance to. Let me just a little closer. Um, but we also want it to behave with MTL, right? So we need to turn on the language <laughs> extension, and then we like func replicative monad, and then everything in MTL that we ever might want to use with this thing, right? It's, it's ridiculous. It's huge. Um, and these are like just the ones I could think of, but there's at least 15 more, and that's just in the standard. And then whenever you want to like work with resources or Redis or like whatever, you have to keep adding things. Uh, it gets really crazy really quickly. But we're not done, right? We also need to implement our monad. And so these are kind of the definitions I had before for like the IO version, right? Um, and then we're almost done. But we also don't want our thing to have to be at the top of the stack. If there's a if there's a uh, bank T anywhere in the stack, we want to be able to have a monad bank at the top of the stack. Uh, so we actually have to write like O of n squared instances in order to like add one thing, which is crazy. It's so much work, right? Um, these are just like the three I could fit on the slide, but you probably need another 10. And those are like just the ones that compose. And like, who knows which ones compose? And like, that's work you have to do. And it seems like uh, we're doing something, right? And it's, we don't have time for this. <laughs> if I want to just like spin up something kind of over the weekend, I don't want to have to write 150 lines of MTL in order to just like, prototype that this thing works, right? And like do it in a way that's going to, to scale in the future. The problem is just like, if it takes a lot of work, it's not gonna get done um, because we just don't have time. We don't care enough. Um, in C++, you can implement like some types, but it's a lot of work and so people don't, even though it's like a great abstraction. Uh, and this is kind of the same thing, right? Even if it's the best practice, you're still probably not gonna do it if it's a lot of work. Uh, the, the more fundamental problem, I think, here is that monads don't really compose. And that's kind of a problem. It seems kind of sketchy because, like, everything else in the language composes, right? Like, <laughs> hmm, what's going on here? Uh, so monad transformers are kind of like our hack on top of that. It's like monad transformers kind of compose, more or less. Um, and so that's why we use them. But in order to get them to actually be useful, we need all this boilerplate that we've been looking at, right? Um, and so, this is kind of maybe the, the question of like, maybe we're doing something wrong, right? This is, I guess, the thing I've learned in functional programming is like, if it seems like too much work, it usually is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the good news is there's a better way, and that's uh, what we want to talk about today. Um, and those, those are free monads. Um, so kind of the, the general idea is the free monad is like a data structure which represents the program you want to run, rather than being a program you can run, right? And it's like when we teach about monads, like that's what we say a monad is. It's like a data structure that represents the program. Um, but then also, like if it has IO, it's got side effects. And like, it's kind of a lie, right? Um, so there's like 20 different free monad packages, at least, and they're all subtly different. Um, I looked through about 10 of them. My favorite is freer effects. And so that's the one we're going to talk about today. Uh, the other one's probably the ideas transfer. I don't know how well they transfer. So let's get it. Is there a paper this is based on? There is. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I think it's called Freer Effects. If you go to the hackage packet. Yeah, it's definitely like Freer. So it's called Freer Monad More Extensible Thanks for that. Yes. See. <laughs> um, and so we kind of get this idea of like we can write it now and we can figure out what it means later. Um, and so the general approach is we, uh, we get to build like a, a DSL, which completely capture the semantics of the program we want to write, and then we can pretend like we have that, and we'll just figure out what that means later. And so we just kind of push the problem down. We say, if, if we lived in a perfect world where we could ex uh, express this thing very tersely, how would we do that? And then we'll figure out the, the implementation later. Um, so that's kind of the slogan of going forward here. So F to the rescue. Um, we, I have freely monetized my code. And uh, so here's the change we need to make, right? Um, you'll notice that the entire change is type signature. The code hasn't changed at all, and that's a really good sign. That means we're not doing anything too crazy, probably, right? <laughs> um, so the difference uh, is this used to be a monad bank. Now it's like member of bank of R, and uh, it used to be a logger, monad log. Now it's member of logger of R, um, and our, we used to have like this polymorphic M, which is now F of R. Um, it seems like a pretty small change, right? Uh, it's, it's um, definitely like mechanical in terms of we have an MTL signature, there is no thinking involved to turn it into an F signature. Um, so it, it looks like a small change, um, but it's actually got like surprising amounts of, of impact of like semantical differences. 
right? So just kind of these are the text images side by side. Um, nothing, nothing interesting. Just this has changed, and then the, the monad, right? Um, so we'll, we listen to the types, and they tell us everything we need to know. So we have this, this monad, right? Um, this used to be an M, now it's an F of R, and we're polymorphic over some R. And the fact that this compiles means that like we don't really care what that R is. The monad instance doesn't depend on that R, which means we're always running the same monad instance for any uh, F code we care about, which is great. That, that instance turns out to be construct a, uh, a data representation of my program. Um, and so it's going to build this tree rather than doing any effects, right? Um, the other thing is we don't have novel typing. Like this used to be a single symbol that said monad bank. And now it's not, now it's like two things. And so it feels like we've kind of factored something out. And if a uh, member isn't like a crazy type family that I have to write an instance for, then it means that um, like this is doing some work for me. And so I probably have to do less work. It turns out it's not a crazy type family. And so that actually holds that reasoning. <laughs> uh, so um, I guess the, the question is though, like what, are, what is this bank, right? Um, who knows, that, that doesn't exist before. Uh, and so, the thing is, if we want to build a data structure that describes our program, we need data in order to be able to build that, right? And so um, this thing used to be a monad bank, right? This is kind of the same idea, um, except now it's a, it's a get. It's, a, it's like a type constructor. So we say bank of A, and this A is uh, a phantom parameter that we'll use eventually. A is not phantom. Um, so we, we say there's two constructors. We can either get the current balance on our bank account, which returns an int, and so that's what this A is. It's like the return type of my action. Um, or I can uh, change my current balance, right, by giving an int, and that returns a unit. Um, so this data structure um, completely is equivalent to, like, the type class I would have written in MTL style, uh, except it's pure data. Um, I need a little bit of boilerplate, unfortunately, because when you write monadic programs, you don't write them in terms of type constructors, you write them in terms of device things, right? And so this is like, if I have, um, a bank as a member of R, which we haven't super talked about, it sounds like R is a container that contains a bank, right? And that's actually a really good intuition. Um, then, for any R that has bank as a member, um, I can get a function which returns an int by way of my type constructor, right? Send, we don't really care about, it's provided by for your effects, um, but essentially it lifts my, my type constructor into like a closely action that I can run in my monad. Um, this is purely boilerplate. There's nothing interesting happening. It's just, unfortunately, it's not what we need to write. And so we can also write one for quick current balance, right? This one takes the amount as an integer, and then it returns a unit. We construct the thing, that returns a unit as the get it. Nothing interesting. Um, but one of the points is, uh, is that boilerplate sucks, right? And so if it's too much boilerplate for you, we, uh, we have template Pascal. So here's my data type. Just build that shit for me. I don't have time, right? <laughs> and so that, that thing at the bottom there, that is exactly equal to these two functions. Um, and so I don't want to write them, so it'll write them for me. Um, this hasn't actually merged yet. I've, I've added a pull request, and it's kind of bike shedding right now. So if you care and you like this, please go say, merge it, please. <laughs> um, yeah. Seems no brainer. Yeah, it, it seems good, right? Is this an R4? Uh, what is that? The, the tax for the free. No, this is, this is, yeah. Yeah, this is in the, the main repo. Um, so just to be complete, we'll also add, figure out what the logger is, right? We have a log, which takes a string. Probably shouldn't be a string, but who cares? I don't care. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it returns a unit. And this is going to give us a lowercase log function, which takes a string and returns an f of the string, right? F of unit. Uh, sorry, yes, an f of unit. Uh, Sandy, why are you using um, logger and returning a maybe rather than having an error effect? Um, the no reason. Absolutely no reason I just wrote this. So, yeah. So what's left, right? We have this R. And that's the only thing we haven't really looked at in this type signature. And if we can figure what that is, probably we'll understand the whole picture. Uh, and so I don't know what this thing is, right? Do you? I don't know. Who knows? But Haskell knows because it compiles. And so we can ask, uh, we can ask the REPL to say, what kind is F? And it gives us this thing that's a little scary if you haven't looked at promoted data kind which is a list of things from star to star. And this isn't like, it's not like a list of integers, it's like a list at the type level. It's a list I can say, I have a bank, and I have a logger, and I have IO, not IO of int, but IO, just missing its type parameter. And I've got a big list of these things, right? Um, this one is the, the thing I'm a function over, and so this is like my return type and my Clicely, and then it gives me a type at the end of the day, right? 
If you squint, this looks a lot like a monad transformer, right? If this were rounded instead of square, that's exactly what a monad transformer looks like. And so it seems like probably there's some, some, some similarity there, right? <laughs> And actually, there's an exact correspondence, which is even better. <laughs> so we've got this like state T of S of a reader of R of IO, right? And if we kind of like move those into a list, that's the kind of the same as a state of S reader of R of IO. And uh, this, so this is actually what the type looks like um, if it weren't polymorphic. If we were monomorphic over these things, um, it's kind of like this. And it kind of makes sense, right? If we we're going to run this type in MTL, we'd run the state first. That chops off the state. Now we've got a reader. We should run the reader that chops at the reader and we get an IO. And kind of the same thing is like if you look at this as a cons list, we can like take the head of that list and chop it off and slowly get down to like um, having handled our effects for some notion of handling. Does that make sense? Hi. Uh, but these are not free monads, right? These are just uh, some standard monads. So, so these, still work with these are just like the gadgets um, that, we, that we designed. So these are not the, like the MTL state. Ah, so, um, so, so, okay. Yeah. I, I thought that this is only going to work with these free monads made from uh, Gadget. Uh, yeah, Gadget so tools. it will, sorry. Uh, so it will not work for actual I.O. This actually does work for actual I.O. for a reason that I am about to get to. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so anything of, of kind star to star can go in here and will type check, and you might not be able to run it, but it'll type check. <laughs> 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 um, so I guess the point is like, um, anything we can express with MTL, we have an equivalent signature in F. Um, and, and so what, right? Like the, the thing is, main runs an IO, it doesn't run an F. And so we need some way of getting from F into IO. Otherwise, who cares about any of this stuff? And the good news is we do have that. We have a capability. And we have this one function which is called run M. And so if we have a singleton list, is this like list of types we care about, which is a monad, it's the only thing in there, it's only a monad. Then what we can do is we can just pull off the fness and we can say, I have a monad that is in this monad, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this, this kind of implies like if we can get a list of only one effect, then we can forget about all our machinery and just pretend like we always had that effect all the way along, right? So this, if this were IO, we can get out of F and we can run something in main. But it doesn't need to be IO, it can be any monad, right? Uh, it could be um, like an MTL stack, and so you can kind of um, stitch this onto an existing program if you want by just putting your existing monad stack at the bottom and having any F kind of on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is it's not just for monads. We also have this function run, which works for pure things. If we don't have any effects we need to handle, that's the same as having a pure value. And so we can just chop it off and get a pure A, right? Uh, no, nothing, no, no monads here. These provide base cases, right? If we, uh, these are the ways of getting out of F. And um, we know that our, our withdraw function, for example, has a, a bank and a logger. So it's got more than two things, and actually neither of them has a monad instance. So we actually can't get out unless we have some sort of induction, right? We have to be able to get from a bigger list to into a smaller list. Um, right, and so we can kind of think of this again, like we think of the R as a cons list. And so it's the list of all the effects we want to handle. And once we've handled all of them, then we can get a value out. And so we kind of need to think of like, what does it mean to handle something, right? Um, essentially, that means we have this list, and the head of it is a logger, and we want to take that logger off and return the rest of the list, right? That's going to make our list a little shorter, to be close to, to only one or having zero things in the list, which means that we can run it in main. Um, so essentially, like this is this is signature, uh, this is promoted data types, and so this is just taking the head of the list at the type level. Um, if we, can, if we can implement this for every type we have, then we can run all our effects, right? This makes sense, I think. Great. <laughs> um, and so what does it mean to run a logger, right? I guess an obvious case is print it to standard out or standard error or something, right? Like, do I.O. with it. Um, and so we can actually say that. We can say, if R contains some I.O. somewhere, then we have the ability to run it, right? We're still in Haskell, so we can't get rid of I.O. entirely, unless we want to like, unsafe perform I.O., but we shouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, we're going through a lot of work to get rid of it. Um, but this, this begs the question, right, is when we started, one of our problems was we had I.O. and we wanted to get rid of I.O. And here are some, we're saying, oh, we've got I.O. again. Uh, have we actually bought anything? And the answer is yes. Um, I think it's on the next slide. Uh, I guess the answer is no. <laughs> um, the, the problem before was the program we wanted to run uh, had I.O. But 
Our program doesn't, right? Our program just has a bank and a logger, and the interpretation of that program has I/O. Um, but the interpretation is just a function, and so we can we can move that out. And the program itself doesn't care about I/O. It's just our understanding of what the program means. Um, so we can have I/O here, and it's not a problem. It's really a point. So, excuse me. Are you saying that this run logger is the only thing that knows about I/O? That's what I'm everything saying. Everything else is not. Right. Correct. And you could have like a void run logger that just ignores the messages, and doesn't require I/O, and interpret your stack. Okay. Yeah. Run logger. Right, you're getting ahead of me, Jay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you work too. Um, yeah, and so um, so we have this type thing, sure, and we want to implement it, right? Um, and so we need to have some notion of running a logger in I/O. We have this function logger to I/O, uh, which takes a logger of X and returns an I/O of X. Um, the implementation of this is we take a log, we deconstruct it, we have a string we want to write, and so we can put the string line that, right? But hey, that is of type unit, and this is of type X. Uh, this is why we need gadgets. The gadget says that the only way of constructing a log is of type uh, of type unit, right? And so even though this is for all x, the only x that it can take is unit, and so we have actually handled all the cases even though it doesn't look like it. <laughs> um, the run nat thing is uh, provided by FreeRFx, and essentially it turns this type signature here, right, into this type signature signature here. Um, so it's just library function that provides the functionality we need to list this thing, this thing into this thing. Um, and so we just say we can run it. What does it mean? Do you need Sorry, what was that? Do you need that type annotation on the uh, logger 2 IO or is it just for? Um, you need them in some cases. My, my strategy is just put them in just in case. Uh, yeah, because all this is like rank two or higher. And so in general type of, type of furnace dies, which is kind of sad, but usually it's only internally. And so usually the rest of it works. I think there's another question. What is what the nat and run? Oh, this is a this is a natural transformation. It's like for all x, if we could turn an f of x into a g of x, we haven't really changed the inside of what's inside that functor, but we changed the functor itself. Um, but it doesn't super matter. It's just that's the name of the library function. If you have a if you have a natural transformation between run uh, g a d t and the monad. And you can run it using your effects if right. you have that monotony. So that would be probably for any moment. Yes, that's true. Um, one reason people like MPL is because all the scaffolding goes away at compile time. Does right. this allow fusing away the internal record? It does allow it. I'm not entirely sure it does. Um, but uh, kind of at the, the type level, this all turns into like a big list of like uncomposed functions, um, which we compose later. And so uh, we actually do have the benefit of not needing to go up and down a stack uh, whenever we left things. And so from what I understand, it performs asymptotically better, but I please don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, F performs asymptotically better? That's what I, that's my understanding of MTL. Yeah, according to paper. According to the paper. According to the paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not testing Wait, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does give some details on it. Right. Um, so we have this function, right? And we can kind of do the same thing for bank. Uh, and so it's the same idea. We write some some bank to I/O, and uh, we can we need to pattern match on our constructors. Um, and so in I/O for the current current bounce, we need to return an int, right? But to put current bounce, we say we've got a new bounce, and we need to return a unit. And that's why this data thing needs to happen. So in this case, the x has to be a, an int here, but in this case, it has to be a unit. Um, a little while, but it works. Trust me on this one. <laughs> Uh, and so we, we've now implemented both uh, our logger and bank in terms of I/O, right? And so we should actually be able to run this function now, right? We go back to the REPL, we say run m dot run logger dot run bank. What type is that? And it gives us this, right? It says you have an f whose first member is a bank, and then a logger, and then I/O at the end. We can actually interpret that into I/O. <coughs> kind of neat, right? Um, this is kind of what we wanted all along. Um, so now we can run this thing in main, and it'll just work. And just to prove that it works. We're going to say, oh, hey, uh, withdraw 50 was the type of applying our interpreter to that. It's an IO maybe int, which is the type we had on our very first slide, which is great, right? It means probably all this stuff works because of type checks. Great. <laughs> um, but it turns out we actually haven't done any work, right? Because this is the same slide. This is where we started. Oh, so if you switched run bank and run logger, this would still type check, right? This would still type check. Does it change semantics at all? No, it doesn't. Yeah, so it's, it's um, yeah, it doesn't in matter case. the orders here. In this case or in general? Um, in this case, <laughs> yeah, because you can write uh, interpreters which depend on other things in a stack lower down. 
and which is kind of what we did, right? Oh, right, right. You need IO to be at the bottom of the stack. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, but and that's because of that member constructor. Yeah. So the member constructor is what keeps all of this polymorphic and withdraw, and then it, it can unify it just based on the type of the constructor. So back to the previous slide. Sure. Right. So IO has to be last. There. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So peel these things off one at a time, right? Cool. Um, so, how do we test it, right? <laughs> the, the eternal question that we've been asking the whole time. Um, and it turns out it's actually pretty easy. We just write different interpreters. And the interpreters are just functions, and so they compose, and so everything works out really lovely. Um, so, the first thing is like, how do we test a logger? And one obvious idea of like, if we want to run it purely, <laughs> is we just completely ignore what it told us to log, right? We just don't have any side effects, and we just carry on our merry way. Um, so handle relay is kind of the function that does that for us. Um, it's like the most general way of writing interpreter in, uh, for your effects. Um, you'll notice it has peer and bind as parameters, which should sound sort of uh, suspicious, right? Have we heard of anything else that takes peer and bind <laughs> as parameters? Hopefully, yes. <laughs> um, and so peer does exactly what you think. Um, and bind is this thing I've written here, right? Um, it takes a logger of x, and then takes an x and an f of r of a. And so it's like, this is the return type of my effect. And this is a continuation that takes a value of that type to continue. And so what this corresponds to is the left arrow in like a bind notation and do notation. It's like, I want to get the value of this sub-expression, give it to me. And that is kind of here. I'm going to continue on with this x here. Um, this one, we definitely knew the, need the type signature, because this one's for all, and this one's for all, and they're different for alls, and like crazy rank things are happening. Um, so just put in the type signatures, and it'll work. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so we have this continuation here, right? And for the same reason, this x always has to be unit in logger, and so we can just apply a unit, and we'll get an f of r a, which is what we want. Um, and we just haven't logged anything, so we can run this purely, right? Do you ever pass anything besides pure? Um, yeah, so the pure, you can, this, this type is actually general enough, you can change the return type. And so the pure is like what happens if you just had a moment which was just return by, right? And with no side effects. Um, so in, unless you want to change the return type, it's always pure. Uh, what, what is the significance of having the continuation? Uh, why is it necessary? Why, why don't we just return FRA? Uh, uh, if we just didn't have this continuation? Uh, yeah. It, it, um, it, so in this case, you don't need it. But in general, you want, um, for like the bank example, you want a way of querying how much money you have in your bank account. And you have no way of passing that data back without the um, and so in the test bank example, right, we, we kind of, we have the semantics like it's like a state, essentially, right? We have some balance that we want to pass along, and we're going to run this in memory like we, we did uh, with our, our, like, test mode thing, right? Um, so handle relay s is exactly like handle relay, except it spreads some state along with us. Um, the semantics here aren't super interesting, except um, we have some state here, which is the incoming state, and our continuation now has an outgoing state, and that's the state for the next time something gets interpreted in not head. Um, so we, we take a, a balance that's like how much money we had originally. When we bind it, we get that, that value back, right? And so if we want to return the current balance, that doesn't change our state. That doesn't change how much money we have in our bank account. But we do want to return it so that the monad that we're interpreting can use that value to do to branch, right? In the case of put current balance, we actually don't care what our, what our state used to be because we're going to change it, right? So we pass that as our new state, and we return the unit, right? Uh, so this is exactly the semantics of a state monad. Um, it's a little jankier, but it works, and hey, it's, you know, right at once. So it seems like we can actually do everything, right? If we go run.ignorelogger.testbank, we get a function which is of f bank logger a to a. And this is pure, right? There's no IO here. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> uh, so we, like, run the same program now, once an IO and once purely, and it's the exact same business logic, and it's just kind of the implementation details have changed. Did you have to give a balance to this to test bank? Oh, I did actually. Good call. Okay. Nice work. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to promise that I compiled all these slides, but that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's say if I had done that, then this would be the testing error. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we can prove like a mostly honest. Uh, we have this withdraw fifty right, <laughs> and now it returns maybe and it's not I O maybe it's not identity maybe it's just the maybe. Pretty sweet. So we can actually test everything we've said now. We can run an I.O., we can run a test, or in purely, right? And it doesn't seem super reusable, because we've got this, like, 
bank thing, we've got this logger thing, and like I had to write a bunch of interpreters for those. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was kind of ad hoc all the way along, right? But the good news is um, we've just kind of been silly. Uh, so we've got this logger type, right? And we take the string and return as a unit, but that actually looks pretty similar to like a standard type, right? Which is the writer. <laughs> So we tell and it takes a W, which is kind of part of our type signature, our, our, uh, our type. And you'll notice there's no mo monoid here. <coughs> um, this, is, this turns out to be a monad even when W isn't a monoid, uh, which isn't the case in MTL. And that's because uh, the mon monoidalness is a property of the interpretation, not of the program itself. And so tying those things together in MTL means you need the monoid constraint, but not here. Um, and our bank thing, right? We've got this like get and put, and then it's over int, but we all know it's a state, right? <laughs> so we'll write it as a state. And, uh, and now uh, this is actually better, right? We've got kind of more denotationalness of like, it's more the structure that matters rather than um, like the specifics of a bank. We don't really care it's a bank, we care it's a state. We don't care that like we're logging, we care that we have um, like an outgoing pipe, right? A write only pipe. Um, and so we can rewrite our original program and do this, right? Our, our bank becomes a statement. Our uh, logger becomes a writer of string. Um, log becomes tell, put, get, uh oh, what's up with this? There's a type annotation there. Maybe I was lying about something. <laughs> um, and this is actually uh, a little janky, but I'm going to argue it's a good thing. Um, we need this int to tell what type we're getting. It seems like we should be able to get that from here. But in general, we can't because we don't have a constraint that says we can only have one type, one effect of state. We can have one of a state of int and a state of double and a state of strings, and we can get all of them and put all of them simultaneously, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of cool. You can't do that in MTL, right? You've got some functional dependencies that say you can't, um, which is sweet. That means we don't need like these giant product types of like, oh, here's all the state I'm ever going to need. It's just shoved in there. Great. <laughs> and we just express this. And so this isn't a property of state. This is just the effect system in general. As long as they have like distinct types at some point, um, and you can infer it somewhere, then you can just add as many effects as you want. And so some of our code has like five different writers of different types because we just care about writing things in different places, right? So in that case, do you define custom names for the versions of tell? You can, I don't. <laughs> Sometimes I'll write a comment if like they're both right beside each other. But usually like you can tell from the types. And as long as the types aren't crazy, then it's usually pretty clear. So in this case, is it actually necessary to have the B, you only have the ones? It, yes, it is necessary in this case. Um, I imagine there's type magic that can be done in order to like infer it if there's only one, but it has been. I think it has been done for readers though. For this type signature, wouldn't you still want like a type alias, like bank equals state in? Maybe. I don't know. Um, that's yeah, up to I, you, right? right. I, I prefer maybe not because then I know what a state is. I don't know what a bank is and I have to go look what a bank is, right? And so this kind of keeps it all in one place. Uh, so more generality, fewer problems, right? We've, we've bought something here. And the thing we bought is we're less likely to have to write custom interpreters if we use more general types. Because for a writer, probably someone's already written one that ignores the argument. Someone's already probably written one that writes the standard out. Um, there's probably one that like sends an email with it or like writes it to like a queue or like who knows? There's all sorts of things. And as long as it's like, a library, then you can kind of push these things out, and the more general your types are, the more likely someone's already done your work. Pretty sweet. Um, so we're uh, so that's kind of like the problem and a bit of a solution. Um, and so so far, it looks like we've kind of haven't really done anything wild. It's like a drop in; it gives us a little bit better testing. Um, but I just want to kind of leave you with some like crazy things you probably can't do with MTL, or if you could, you wouldn't want to. That are actually really easy in the system. Hi. Before you get that, sure. I have one like thought experiment. Imagine you you could like get rid of all the template Haskell that generates the magic MT or in front of magic F stuff. Right. Because I know you've already written a magic template Haskell that generates some MTL stuff as yeah. well. Yeah. And you just compare the two. It seemed to me that in the MTL example, your boilerplate is a function of the number of instances that you have or the number of different kinds of effects that you have. As well as the interpretation stuff. Because for each interpretation you need a carrier and you need to lift it over the entire MTL stack. Right. Let's let's ignore the interpretations for a moment. Okay. And then in the F world, 
the, the boilerplate as a function of the number of primitives in your Gaddis, right? which seems like an interesting trade-off, actually. Um, unless I'm misinterpreting, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, so the, the, the boilerplate for Gata is like one per constructor, like one line of code and one, temp, one type uh, annotation per constructor um, for each effect. And so that turns out in like all the things we've got we have maybe 10 effects. And so there's maybe, what, 50 lines of boilerplate versus you'd have at least 50 lines for a single effect uh, with an MTL strategy. So could you imagine a situation where you have like a big gadget with a whole bunch of operations, right? And it and it would actually might be easier to go with MTL, even though I agree with you, there's there's a lot of MTL overhead as well. I'd be surprised. <laughs> if you if you had like fewer <laughs> different different components, but like you have these big individual languages. I, I would be surprised if there's ever less well like whatever. Um I haven't answered that kind of I'm on the same team. Uh, we actually thought about creating that for say Redis, where like for every Redis command you have this effect, but it actually turns out to work better where you have like a tightly scoped effect for the specific thing you care about doing. Yeah. Cool. Good yeah. answer. Take <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so dropping from MTL, yes, but more. Uh, conceptually, there's a different execution model happening, right? Uh, when you run a reader, um, you kind of get an M out, right? You get some monadic action out at the other end. And um, that thing might do side effects, right? Maybe not in the case of reader, but in general, um, in the MTL idea, you kind of like run all of your reader at the same time as, as like a layer. And you run all of the, like your state, and you run all of your, your writer, right? And you're kind of like kind of running these big chunks of, of your monadic code simultaneously. And so for the most part, that doesn't matter. But if you have something like, like an error in there, like error T or accept T, I guess, um, then it kind of matters like which order you run these things in, right? Because they don't always compose. Um, so in F, we kind of have this different thing, right? We have this, uh, this data structure which represents our program, and we run a reader, and at the end we still get a data structure which represents our program. So nothing has happened here. The only monadic action happens when we do run M, right at the very end of our stack. Which kind of means like, I kind of think this is a compiler, right? We have like something and we're taking our reader, we're compiling that into like IO somehow. And then we're compiling our next step into IO or into something lower in the stack, and we just kind of slowly compile it to like, IO or some other monad. Um, that means kind of the monadic actions all get like run sequentially rather than like as big layers chunks, um, which means this actually plays a lot nicer with things like error handling, um, which I don't super have time to get into, but uh, come find me afterwards if you're interested. <laughs> so we can actually interpret uh, effects in terms of one another. And uh, I think John was asking earlier about like an exception. So we had an exception type, right? Exception of E. Uh, the E is the exception we care about. So we can throw an error which takes an E and returns an A. And that's polymorphic. It's like, we'll give you back anything because the semantics are short circuiting. So you can never inspect it anyway. So it doesn't matter what we give you. Uh, and we make freer. So that gives us like lowercase throw error, right? Um, and we can actually write a, uh, like an interpretation of a writer, which um, the, the interpretation is everything we tell is an error. And once we've told the entire set of, of problems, then we will package that up into an exception and throw it, right? Um, so kind of like, we, we've got this program, right? We run it in terms of the pure writer, which is semantically the MTL run writer. It gives you back like a monoid of the things you're gonna write, and then the return diet. And as long as that isn't empty, that means we, we produced an error, right? And so we can throw that as, as the E, uh, because we have an exception E somewhere in our stack. So like in terms of a compiler, right? We, you don't want to like die the first time you see an error. You want to kind of accumulate all the errors you see of a certain type and then send them off to the user. So you don't have to like fix one, recompile, oh, there's another error, fix it, recompile, fix it, recompile. You say, here's all the problems we ran into, you fix them, right? Um, and this is actually like really annoying to write if you wanted to do it purely grammatically. Um, but here we don't have to. We say, here's a writer that produces errors. And as soon as you finish producing any errors, then just package them up into an exception to throw. Pretty cool. <laughs> um, so you get a prog here yep. where there's a writer effect at the front, right. and you don't know what's in R. You only know that there's an exact yeah. PXCC. Exactly. What if the writer of prog had had member IOR when they wrote it, okay. and they depended on IO effects to determine what they were going to write? Right. 
How are you getting a list of all of the messages? It works. The interpreter does. Uh, <laughs> you're not actually doing anything until you get to the interpreter. Right. So that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so this is this would be really hard to write in MTL Absolutely. in a in a kind of bundled way, right? So uh, actually, okay. question about the monoid instance here. So right. previously we said that writer does not require a monoid right. to construct. So why is it required now? Uh, because this pure writer is exactly the run writer function from MTL, which requires an oh, monoid, right? Okay. Just to be able to push these things together. Well, you could have a writer that just the first thing you write is the only thing it keeps. Yeah, right. you wouldn't need a okay. yeah that just happens to not be the same as we want in this case. So, um, in the type of this, the kinds of program you can pass to a and throw is stuff that only knows that it has a writer effect and has to be polymorphic in every other effect. Um, so, kind of the idea is uh, the thing we know is that the head of our list is a writer. Okay. Right. And so as you're interpreting it, this pulls off the writer. And so you just, depending on what you call it, and you're like a composition of those interpreters is um, how that works. It's just like exchanging. Oh, the frog effect. couldn't yeah. do anything. That's cool. It could take advantage of everything else in R. We just don't care about what else is right. <laughs> right. Okay. Cool. Uh, the, one of the speakers this morning uh, used applicative to do this. Uh, so what's right? He used applicative. Instead of my man. Okay. And he said that uh, basically, that what you could do was get concurrency out of applicative right. that you don't get out of monad. Yes. So, when you package <laughs> these things up, are you not packaging everything up? Um, you are definitely packaging these up monoidally, or sorry, monadically. So, I don't know what the concurrency situation looks like. And I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. But I would love to explore that afterwards. Yeah. It so. should be possible when there aren't dependencies to figure that out. Yeah. But that would seem like there is there is a there is a version of free monad that uh, combines free applicative and free monad in right. one package. Yes. And then you can distinguish effects that can be parallelized from effects that cannot right. be parallelized. But this is not doing it for the moment. Yes, exactly. I don't know about that stuff. I'm sure it's doable. I'm probably not smart enough to figure it out. But uh, <laughs> this is what I got. So. Uh, we can actually also do non-trivial transformations. And so the nice thing about this is I can just kind of like really nilly assume I've got functionality, right? And in this case, I'm going to say I've got some functionality which is like I've got a set somewhere. I don't know where. I don't really care. It could be uh, it could be memory. It could be in Redis. It could be on file. Who cares? As long as it has set add, which takes an S and adds it to my set, and has contains, which returns a bool whether or not I've added it, right? Um, I just kind of made this up on the spot. And that's kind of the great thing about this is you can just make up things on the spot. And um, it kind of goes against my strategy of like, make it as generic as possible, but sometimes this is exactly what you need, right? And so if we have this, we can actually write a deduper. Um, so I've got a writer and I've got a set and they're over the same W, right? Um, and I've got this function interpose, which allows me to handle an effect without removing it from my stack. And that's why a writer doesn't pop off here, right? Um, so what I want to do is reinterpret a writer in terms of itself, but like inject code around it. And so my interpretation takes a tell and a continuation and says, have I already told you this? And if so, I'm not going to tell you again. But if I haven't, I'm going to add to my set and then tell you, right? And so I've actually like injected code around each like instance of tell, right? Uh, which I don't know how you do this in MTL. <laughs> Maybe it's doable. <laughs> Um, and so, and that's just like, this is just a function. I just compose them and I just, I can handle my individual writers and my individual sets however I care. This doesn't matter. It just has rewritten it, right? And kind of like the, uh, the data is code in Haskell. This is like the code is data. It's, it's the code Haskell. It's, 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 um, and so I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's all I've got. Summing up is like, F gives us this like MCL composability without all the boilerplate. And all that boilerplate turns out to probably have just been a hack in order to get any of it to work. Um, we get testing mostly for free, which is pretty sweet. Um, and like every effect turns out to have a pure interpretation. And so for any effect, we can write uh, a pure version. And this kind of like forces us to separate our business logic, which is like the F programs we want, where we have this terse language to describe the problem from the implementation details, right? Which is like, how are we going to do it? Which is the interpretation, which is like, where all the gritty details go. Um, but the nice thing about that is that means that's all library code. That means I can reuse all that code. It's not in my monad. It's somewhere else. It's a function that I can call later. And so it just all works out.
Check. Where do you spend most of your time working? And like, is this logic or implementation? It's details? it's all interpreters. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I've writ I wrote um, a kind of a CSV importer. There's about 1,200 lines of like MTL and like conduit in order to get the streaming. You want to like pull in records and like read them and then stream them out. And that turns out to be about a 15 line F program with about 500 lines of interpretation. So it's about the same length, except that I can reuse that code and I couldn't reuse it for my nice. like, conduit view map. So, so that's all I got. Uh, thanks for listening. If you have any questions, now's a good time. Where is the, you say that's on a repo somewhere? Uh, yes, this, uh, it's in freer effects, is the, ha the hackage package. Freer effects. Yeah. I and don't what know. about your slides? Yes. Oh, my slides um, are on GitHub. I will post them on Reasonably Polymorphic. I haven't done it yet, but I will. Thank <laughs> you.